So the next topic we're going to hit are SEDs and color color and color magnitude diagrams. So just as a setup for that, I sort of see SEDs in color color and color magnitude diagrams are sort of two facets of a giant metaphorical data cube floating in front of me. An SED allows me to see many wavelength points, but for just one object at a time. A color color or color magnitude diagram allows me to see many objects, but just two to four wavelengths at a time. Both ways of looking at the information are very useful and they're in entirely different units, but we're gonna use them both. The points that end up being outliers in the SED will also make that object an outlier in the color magnitude diagram. And points that are missing from the SED means that the object is gonna be missing from that corresponding color magnitude diagram. Okay, so now we're gonna co cover color magnitude and color color diagrams. We're gonna start with the optical. So you probably have in your Astro 101 textbook a picture that looks something like this. This is an HR diagram or a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and it is sort of a cartoon of it in that it's sort of stylized. But the way that it's usually presented in the in your textbooks is, you know, they point out that luminosity is on the y-axis. You have bright at the top and faint at the bottom. And then you've got temperature across the x-axis, so hot on the left and cold on the right. But what actually gets observed is magnitude and color. So you've got magnitude here, absolute magnitude. Remember, small numbers are bright, big numbers are faint. And then we've actually got what's written here is spectral class, but what's actually measured is color, like B minus V color. So blue is on the left and red is on the right. So technically, an HR diagram is the theoretical space. In other words, the luminosity and the effective temperature. And what we're actually measuring, though, is brightness and color, say V and B minus V. So it is an HR diagram is really a color magnitude diagram when you observe it. So even before you realized what was going on, you already know something about color magnitude diagrams. So the whole power of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram or the color magnitude diagram, the optical color magnitude diagram, is that things in particular regions of the diagram are going to be particular kinds of stars. So if I put a new object up here and asked you what it was, you'd tell me it was a giant. If I put a new object right here and asked you what it was, you'd say it's a K star, I mean sequence K star. If I gave you a new object and put it down here, you'd say, oh, it's a white dwarf. So you know, if you have a new object of unknown nature that is placed in that diagram, you have a guess as to what the object is. So that, I, this, this HR diagram is really kind of a cartoon. It's um, not reality, it's sort of cleaned up to show you the, the main points. This is a real uh, color magnitude diagram. So this is data from Hipparchos, which was a European satellite that studied distances to nearby stars, relatively nearby stars. And so what's on the y-axis here is absolute V magnitude. So it's the V magnitude that was measured. And because Hipparchos was looking for distances, all of the magnitudes here have been corrected. So they're absolute magnitude. So they're all metaphorically at the same distance in order to be plotted here. And then we've got B minus V color on the x-axis. So uh, you, you can see that you've got a main sequence and you've got a giant branch there's a couple of white dwarfs down there but there's also scatter in there there's stars that you know it doesn't make any sense why stars would be here or even down here so and then the you know there's a finite width to the main sequence as well so if you pick any random chunk of sky you're going to have stars at a variety of distances so that's also going to smear out the main sequence and if you just pick a random chunk of sky you're going to have galaxies in there too Young stars are even more complicated. So this is another picture from a textbook. We've got luminosity on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis, just like for a HR diagram. But this time what I'm plotting is a stylized view of um, young star evolution. So if you approximate the main sequence by that line, you've got some lines of 
stars of constant mass. In other words, a 15 solar mass star will pretty much move straight left before igniting hydrogen and landing on the main sequence. Um, when, by the time you get to three solar masses, you get a little bit more of a dip before it goes left. And by the time you get to one solar mass, it's mostly vertical and then goes left and then alights on the main sequence. So the dashed lines here are isochrones or lines of constant age. So any star that's near that line is only 10 to the four years old here. 10 to the 5 years old, here 10 to the 6, a million years old, and here 10 to the 7. So you've got, you can tell immediately that the high mass stars evolve quickly and the low mass stars take much longer. But here's the really important part. They're all above the main sequence. And if you have a cluster that's truly all the same age, you're going to have them clumping around an isochrone. It may not be an exactly 10 to the 6 isochrone, but the whole point is that, yeah, they'd be, if they really were all the same age, they'd be clumped around the same isochrone. So this is uh, going even further into, into the messiness of reality. Here on the y-axis, I have I-band. On the x-axis, I have V minus I. So you can kind of see that there's a gap here, right? So this is field stars and this is Orion. So I'm looking at a region, a star forming region where uh, because of where I have pointed the telescope, an awful lot of what I'm seeing in that image are actually members of Orion, but especially near the edges of the field, I get a lot of field stars. And then I've got some stragglers down here that are really faint and anomalously so. You can see that my data pretty much crap out at around 16 and a half magnitudes in I. So yeah, that's the that's Orion. This is another view, the same fields. Again, I versus V minus I, but now we've got some different annotations. So this solid line here is the zero age main sequence. In other words, where they alight when they are, when they finally ignite hydrogen at the distance of Orion. Um, here's that clump of things that we're taking to be Orion. The dashed line is the gap between, whoops, gap between the Orion clump and the field. You can see Orion and field. Um, here we've got some limitations, right? So I not I observed at different exposure times for V and I and U because this project was also looking for UV excesses, and it you can't, it's harder to go fainter, right? So even though we had a longer exposure time in V than I, and a longer exposure time in U than V, we still didn't get to very faint stars. So stars be below this dashed line, I don't have a measurement for everything in V. I have a measurement for some things. You can see there are some stars there, but there's not very many stars below that line for which I have a V magnitude compared to above that line where I have V for almost everything. The same thing is true here. U isn't showing up in this diagram, but you can really see that U just is not going anywhere near as faint as uh, I did for V or for I. So remember that magnitudes include an implicit distance, but colors don't. So color color diagrams, because you know, color magnitude diagrams are going to involve distance on the y-axis, but color color diagrams are going to not have distance involved at all because if you have a color on the x-axis which is independent of distance and a color on the y-axis which is independent of distance, then you don't have to worry about distance. Um, so that color color diagrams can therefore also help you in identifying what sources are. It is, I think, somewhat rare to see optical color color diagrams. Um, so here, here I've just given you, I'm going to give you a couple. So this is um, you minus, it's a U, it's a color color plot looking for ultraviolet excess. So the y axis is U minus V, the x axis is V minus I. And I, the reason, so it's plotted somewhat funny, right? So I've plotted it so that blue things are at the top and red things are at the bottom. So I'm not the only person to do this. It made sense to me at the time, um, but now I don't like it so much. So I'm going to flip it over and then fix the labels for you. So you've got U minus V, so red is at the top and blue is at the bottom. And then I've got V minus I, so red is on the left and, well, sorry, blue is on the left and red is on the right. So, so the reddening vector goes up and to the right because it's going to be pushing it red in both directions. The solid line is where the main sequence lives right? 
So you end up with a clump of stars scattering around that line because those are the main sequence stars. All the things that are bluer than you expect are the ones that are UV excess stars. In other words, the ones that are actively accreting. So what are these guys up here? They're stars from here that have been pushed up here because they're reddened. So this is an IFAS color color diagram and I was trying to find a good clear one to use for this uh, talk, but I couldn't find one easily and so I just gave up and made one. So this is for our region, I see 417. We've got the Y axis is R minus H alpha. The X axis is R minus I. So note that R and I are broadband, but H alpha is narrow band. So I'm using a color color diagram with one narrow band filter. Reddening is going to push you up into the right. The green line here is where the main sequence stars fall. So stars that are rotating quickly and so they have a lot of chromospheric activity are going to be brighter in H alpha than normal. And young stars that are rotating quickly are going to have a, a lot of activity. So they're going to have a lot of H alpha brightness. So when you have H alpha bright, the numbers get smaller. So R minus H alpha gets larger. So all the guys up here are the active stars, in other words, the likely young stars. These guys are red into main sequence. You can see they've been pushed out more or less parallel to the reddening vector from that clump down there. Now I have to have a couple of slides about Stromgren photometry. So specifically because you can get rid of distance when you work with colors, and specifically given the SED shapes of disc-free high-mass stars, by which I mean O and B and some A and F, there was an astronomer called Bent Stromgren in 1956 who defined some filter band passes and more specifically combinations of the filter band passes that specifically for high-mass stars are really good for getting effective temperature and even metallicity and moreover are resistant to reddening. So there are four main indices, B minus Y, M1, C1, and beta. And these are the colors. They're actually, it's even more confusing because it's a difference of colors. Um, so Y, you can kind of sort of think of as Johnson V. B minus Y helps you get effective temperature. C1 helps you get surface gravity. And M1 helps you get metallicity. So we have stronger in photometry from one literature paper in IC417, which is why I'm bringing this up. For what we're doing, it basically just means more points for the SED, but I wanted to try to be complete in this um, slide collection. All right, so we looked at SEDs before. This one is an SED, so um, spectral energy as a function of wavelength. It's a log-log plot. This is from the 2019 IDLE team, which they were specifically studying the Lagoon Nebula. So this is another YSO candidate. So on the uh, Rayleigh gene side, I've got a black dashed line here that assumes, so if K is on the photosphere of the star, which may or may not be a good assumption, but if K is, then if the star had no dust, all the other points would fall on that black dashed line. But clearly they don't. Clearly they are above that. That chartreuse dashed line is a fit to all available points between 2 and 25 microns. So that line is telling you that this, so the slope of that line you can see here is minus 1.36, so that tells you it's a class 2. So you can see, especially in the SED, that there's very clearly an infrared excess. So I'm going to draw a line to guide the eye on the vein side as well. That's a little harder to do because it's, you know, has to be a curve. But you can see that it goes through almost all the data points pretty well, and then the bluest data point is really high. That's the G-band measurement from PanStars. So assuming that G-band measurement is accurate, this star has a pretty big ultraviolet excess because it's, it's spilled over from the U-band into the G-band, and you can see it's a pretty big excess. It's like a dex. It's like an order of magnitude in there. So in order to do a better job of fitting this side, I need a spectral type because then I can get a, a stellar model and I can fit it to everything K and shorter and then I can more uh, definitively say, okay, this is an excess of this many magnitudes and that's an excess of that many magnitudes. 
So the main takeaway points for optical color magnitude and color color diagrams, remember that colors are differences in magnitudes, which are also ratios of fluxes. And they're always bluer band minus redder band, so that a smaller color is bluer and a larger color is redder. When you make plots of colors and magnitudes, it helps you understand the properties of objects you know. And then once you establish that, you can apply those properties to understand the nature of objects you don't know. The optical points are largely going to be on the Veen side of the SCD, and sometimes they're going to straddle the peak. Because of that, you can tie optical points to effective temperatures. Now, excesses, whether in the ultraviolet or the infrared, can be identified in either color color or color magnitude diagrams, depending on how on what you want to do, or you can see them in SCDs.